You are listening to The Nothing Podcast with Nobody Important, where a group of nobodies speak to an actual somebody. And now your hosts, John and Frank. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm John. I'm Frank. And you are listening to The Nothing Podcast with Nobody Important. And boy, this week we have got something Real special, real close to my old heart. Uh, it, it, it's our childhoods wrapped in an hour and a half. Absolutely. It's a whole episode about fandom mm-hmm. with Jason Bischoff, who is a writer and creator of such brands that you've known as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Overwatch, Power Rangers. And today he serves as the director of global licensing and business development for Funko. And if that's not good enough for you, he also wrote an edition of Wonder Woman. Yeah. Like a real Wonder Woman. Absolutely. Amazing. He's really into it. He knows geekdom and fandom, and we got to talking all about what it is that makes us connect to these brands and, and makes us identify with them. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Funko are those little statues that you see people have that have the characteristically have these big heads and little bodies and the the big round eyes. I mean, they are a huge deal right now. Yep. And it doesn't look like they're going anywhere because they service all sorts of fandom. Everything you could possibly think of. I have I have ones that range from Ghostbusters to Caddyshack to Power Rangers to Fifth Element, everything. Like totally and, random. And they stuff. sell they sell them everywhere. Everywhere. You can't go everywhere. Yeah, like you can't go yeah. ten feet without seeing them. Well now you shouldn't go ten feet anywhere outside your house. Because we're right. still so zooming. So stay in your house. Yeah, we're still yeah, zooming. Super. We're still zooming. He came to us live from old California. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's fun too. Oh yeah, it was a great time. It was a great. It was really yeah. interesting. Um, Jason came to us by way of Matt, who you know is kind of uh, an expert in specific fandom, as it were. And he and Jason have crossed paths, and he got us uh, Jason, who's who ended up being a who is a big deal, but ended up being a great, great guest. And he doesn't know it, but he is going to be our best friend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's just get into it. And please, let's welcome this week's guest. Jason Bischoff, writer, creator, and director of global licensing and business development for Funko. Frank. Yeah. I'm, I got to tell you, I'm particularly excited for this one. You're geeking out. I am. I you're, am. You're geeking out so much, Matt is here. Yeah, Matt. We're getting ready. <laughs> Hello. So uh, let's just get into it. Let us welcome Jason Bischoff. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. It's no, a big please. day on the podcast, Jason. Yes, absolutely. By coastal we are. That's what oh, nice. Was. Yeah. C- congratulations. I'm glad you can finally talk about that with your friends and family. Yes. <laughs> it's taken me a while. Especially with your wife sitting next to you. Yes. <laughs> okay. I've gotten there. It's 2020. Yeah. So, uh, as, as you might have just heard, uh, to cut it down, basically, Jason, you uh, have been working in the toy and collectible and kind of pop culture industry for quite some time now, yes? Yeah, going on 16 years. Wow. wow. Yeah. So um, I guess that's a little bit of a softball tee up and forgive me, I'm going to go on a tangent here for a second. Do it, please. I am, by all rights and definition, a professional weirdo. Um, and what I well, that is, you know, in school originally, I wanted to be a Walt Disney Imagineer, um, was broke <sighs> upon graduation to learn that they only took architecture and engineering majors. Um, my best friend, somebody I've known since I was 13, um, said, hey, you should consider getting into toys and comics. Lo and behold, ne- ended up spending the next three and a half years at Playmates Toys, working on Ninja Turtles and The Simpsons and Disney Princess um, and uh, Gads. Uh, that, which was kind of like a like a big deal for me, right? I was a huge Turtles kid growing up and played sure, right yeah, there sure. in my backyard. Um, and then one of my other lifelong best friends whom I've known since I was six um, basically recruited me into Blizzard Entertainment where I went over, kind of made the leap, almost spent a decade there kind of building the licensing team from the ground up. So I worked on everything from World of Warcraft to Starcraft to Diablo to Overwatch, which was kind of like my home, so to speak. Um <laughs> even, back, even back when it was uh, originally um, Project Titan, right? So we were working on that for quite some time. 
Jason, let me ask you, when you worked at World of Warcraft, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no. Was there was there like a, a one person who would play from Queens in a basement <laughs> like every day for 40 hours who looked like Danielle? <laughs> did you did she come up on your motherboard at all or <laughs> like was there any any talk of an intervention for her? So, or any like maybe, you know, she sort of socially isolated before it was cool, like anything like that? So Danielle, then I'm going to I'm direct this straight at you. What did you play and do you still play? I don't still play, but since we went into quarantine, it's been really hard to not download it. Yeah, I have been, sure. I've been hesitating a couple of times. So which one? You played World of Warcraft? I played World of Warcraft. But, but what did in, you roll? Um, a uh, warlock. I was a lock. Yeah, I was a lock. And hey, watch out, John. Kinda, watch your, out, John. This your, lock is moving in on your warlock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alancia. Alancia. So Alancia. Old. What? What race? I can't remember. Oh, um, Horde. It was Horde, but um, I don't even remember now. It's cool. so long ago. It's it totally. The originals. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, I actually played Alliance for what it's worth. I was a. Oh yeah. Alliance human warlock. Wow. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Dark I mean, elf. Dark elf. Yes, I was Horde Dark Elf. Yeah, right on. You were a what? A what Dark Elf? No, Don't no. Don't worry horde, about it. Horde, oh, horde. I literally thought Daniel was like, I was a Horde Dark Elf. I was like, that's a weird That'd be really cool. I've never schooler. played. I've never. I'm not really into those RPGs, but like for me, like, I feel like I definitely would be like, yeah, I could be a loose woman. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what were you? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in the Enchanted Brothel again. For yeah, an hour yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my so, God. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. but yeah, go on. No, please. no, no, no. And I'll just kind of round it out. So, was there for about a decade, and then um, basically Zordon called and I answered, and I worked on Power Rangers for about three and a half years. That's crazy. And then now I'm gratefully over at Funko and tearing it up and enjoying it every single day. Really? It's, you're loving it, huh? Oh, very much so. Like, it's like the kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in all transparency, for me, the places I have always felt most at home and most myself were those places where it was an opportunity where it was kind of like a small atmosphere. Um, you know, Blizzard, big company, but at the time it was a small atmosphere. Um, same thing. It was kind of that case. It, that, that was the case very much so at Saban. So it was really just an opportunity to get to know a lot of folks across the board, really just embrace the better parts of myself and, um, and really be able to find myself within the greater corporate culture, nonetheless, the bigger mission statement. And so Funko is very much so like, all about that. It's a little different in that it's got its own brand of chaos um, because sure. from my end of the spectrum, we're talking about like 1,300 active licenses. So it's basically wow. anything that's ever been anything across celebrity, pop, you, I mean, you name it, right? But in that same respect, it's lovely to see how people express themselves and um, yeah, just it's rad. Wonderful people. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to bury the lead here, but um I am uh, I'm, I'm deaf. I'm a Funko collector. Oh, right so. on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Danielle and I have quite a bit. Th uh, thank you for like your patronage. <laughs> oh, thank you for continuing to <laughs> because I, I make them. I'll buy them. Yeah. Here I am. In, here I am in quarantine. Nobody's going anywhere. Only essential business. People are looking for certain things only. I'm out there saying, where can I order the complete dinosaurs bundle yes. from? You like said that to me yesterday. <laughs> I'm I'm looking for sites. I'm like comic stores. Amazon doesn't have it yet. I'm like, what's going on? Like, you're, you're talking about dinosaurs, like Earl Sinclair dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, ah, yeah. Like okay, Jim cool. Henson dinosaurs. Cool, 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 cool. So um, then I have to ask, what lines do you collect? I I collect um, only the pop. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, you mean oh, you mean pop? Like oh, what lines mean, within pop do you collect? Yeah. Oh, 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 all, all of them. I, but all, yeah, no, a lot of them. There's, there's no limit. I thought you meant like other, you know, segments under the Funko. Like, oh, I, I mean, that'd be the, lovely too. The, the soda cans. So yeah. Like, right. No, oh, I have all the Labyrinth, all the, anything Jim Henson, the uh, Fraggle Rock, uh, the Sesame Street line. Um, we have anything Little Mermaid. Uh, Danielle has every Ariel that's been made except for the, There's one that was, it was like the, and Ursula, and it was like sparkly, and then now it was like, like a 2009 exclusive or I, something. Like um, that. By the way, Danielle, you should come and visit next time you're in you're in LA. We've got Funko Hollywood when the world opens again. Let's be real, but 
Um, next time you're in Hollywood, we do have, um, it's a 40,000 square foot facility. We've got 14 sets, right? One of which is dedicated to the Little Mermaid. It's an entire um, sunken ship. Um, we've got Ursula in there and kind of full scale and Ariel as well. So please come on by. We have I'd no be happy to take you around and be good fun. So Jason, That's I just want you to know that nice flat screen TV behind you, the microphone, your blazer, John paid for all that. So yeah. John, you did a good job. Jason's place looks nice. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, yeah, it's that's my wife's. She's an actor, so she needs that. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, we have we can run the gamut of what we have. I mean, going from we have like Leonardo da Vinci, who Danielle would not let me keep on the same shelf as Vince McMahon. Oh, nice. And, and like, because <laughs> they were getting a little too cuddly. Well, I, mean? I have a genius shelf where I keep uh, a genius I was, shelf. I, you I have, have Fred Rogers on that. I have Fred Rogers. Brilliant. I have Jim Henson. I have Vince McMahon. I had da Vinci. I have Conan O'Brien. Um, were people who I just like hold at a high standard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't been able to get my hands on a Stan Lee yet. And uh, I'm I well, do not you're, the you're missing the greatest genius of all, right? Right. I know my nephew has it. Can I show you something that you may or may not know about Funko employees? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm so excited. Here. Did you do they constantly fall over because they're not balanced so well? Cause they're huge <laughs> yeah. heads? that's why I have to wear the blazer. Cause I've got little, <laughs> tiny baby hands and baby legs. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but on every single Funko employee business card, the employee gets to choose the three characters that are represented there. Did you know that? No. Yeah. I didn't. So, um, I'll show you mine. I'll be careful about my information here, but yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Uh, so check it out. Oh, wow. So for me, I kind of did like a past, present, future. Kind of sure. Of course. Fan, but love it. Uh, yeah. Everybody's got all sorts of different stuff. Uh, and it, the entirety of the Funko world is open. So employees need only like pick what they want and then they get it. Oh, that's so Wow. Cool. That's I'd so have three cool. on there to be like, wow, I didn't even know why we made that one. Like, <laughs> like, those are the kind of ones that I get. Like the ones that just like stand out as like, what the hell? Why did they make this? Jason, I would like to say, now look, I am not, look, I, I like Funkos. I have one. John has almost all of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And like, oh, I know all the things we're going to talk about in this episode. I'm sort of out of the loop a little bit on things, but I did have a childhood, I swear. So I probably know some of the stuff you're going to talk about. Yeah. But in terms of Funko, so my day job is uh, I'm a guidance counselor. Right? Yes. So in my office, I have, which I thought was the Fred Rogers Funko Pop, which John, because I feel that's very, I'm, I'm connected. Yeah. But John told me this is the... Tom Hanks playing Mr. Rogers Funko Pop. Yeah. Fine. Because to me, I, I get the difference, but okay. It still looks like Mr. Rogers. I am begging you. I need a Sigmund Freud Funko Pop. Mm. Please. You have to delve into psychology and get some like big names. Like, like Sigmund Freud would be amazing if you could do it. So I'm just putting it out there. Uh, some ideas. Out. Let me yeah. let me Chief Wiggum here and type it on my imaginary typewriter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I think it's a great idea. We've done a lot of, uh, you know, we've done a lot of personalities across history. Um, could we end up doing something like that? Maybe. Um, I can neither confirm nor deny that we've oh sure done something like that. No, of course, of course. Of course. This is not. We're we're not gonna. Uh... We're not going to beg you. There's for... nobody. There's, there's, no, there's no. There's no one here requesting anything. No, no. But but if I could do it, if it was up to me, which it is not. But if it, if I could do it, um, I would make it as a pop ride, um, and ah. it, uh, Freud in a chair with a notebook, kind of whatever, and then it would come with like an empty couch for you to put other Funkos on. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and that's why you do this for a living. That's amazing. That's so cool. That's so yeah. Cool. That's cool. So uh, yeah, like I said, this is not going to be a uh, us just asking about making more Funkos, but um, you got to make more Bill and Ted. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, no, I, I don't want to really jump around because I want to go back to the beginning. I want to talk about you, sure. Um, but let's 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 put a cap on this part of the conversation while we're talking about IPs and brands and things like that. Um, and I don't know how much you can talk about it. It's out there. I know it's out there. There's a. Uh, I know that you had said that Back to the Future was one of the things that kind of shaped you as a, as a person. You're, oh yeah, uh, as a brand. Okay. So Danielle is obsessed with Back to the Future. We have a whole wall dedicated to it. We have the newspapers. I we have Marty McFly. Anytime we go to Comic Con, she goes as Marty McFly to Comic Con. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We have we have the Pepsi Perfect. We have 
uh, everything. And You're she has the whole collection. She has all the any pop that's been made. Your wedding, uh, our wedding, right? We had oh yeah, we had um, a Delorean and a Ecto One at our wedding. We are I, we're going to throw down right now. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> yeah, um, I think so. okay. Well, yeah, I'm I'm with you 100. percent I'm yeah excited to hear that you had both of those things because both of those things are very much so part of me as a person, right? Huge Mm -hmm. fan, huge Back to the Future fan. Kim and I did have the DeLorean at our wedding as well. Yes, there you go. The DeLorean. Believe it or not, and it's probably not worth much, but, um, but, uh, so I had jokingly told my wife, like day one of planning after we're engaged and all that good stuff, I had joking, jokingly said something like, oh, we'll get the DeLorean as our getaway car. And then Kim was like, with the most stern face I've ever seen in our 14 years together, she said, oh no, we're doing that. Like it was, it, it became mandatory. So um, I contacted the DeLorean Motor Company of California and lo and behold, they have what's called the, the quote unquote hero DeLorean which is the one that they keep um, for all of the universal special events, right? Now, I'm going to tell you just a side story here because it's fun or whatever. But basically, the expectation and the agreement that we signed was that the, the owner of that vehicle would be at the wedding. We'd be able to take a bunch of pictures. And then that night, as we're getting away, we would load into the car on the passenger side exactly as it's reflected in the film. And then they would drive us away, right? So we go through the whole ceremony. It's a lovely evening. Everybody's wildly entertained. The place where we had the wedding, um, it was an art gallery. So it had this like garage underneath the building. And we had arranged for everybody to be down, uh, down kind of the driveway and um, sparkler deal. You know, everybody's got the sparklers going and the whole thing is rigged for light and sound. And of course, like the overture starts playing and the damn thing revs up and the gates open. Right. And it's, it's almost, scene for scene right out of the flick and the car rolls up and Danny, the owner gets out of the car and hands me the keys. And Oh my God. You're like, Danny, this is not what we talked about. Right? Like this is a big deal. He goes, no, it's good. Go on, go for it. Right? So we load into the car, close it, right? Butterfly door. Luckily I drove stick for, that was my first car. And, (laughs) <laughs> we all and she won't go into first gear like no matter what I do she will not go into first gear and so the music's still going and people are starting to get a little weird and restless right and Danny comes over and he knocks on the window and he's like I forgot to tell you I'm so sorry because of the 600 pounds of other stuff that's on the car we had to change out the engine to be a custom 12 block GMC engine so you have to kick. Um, you have to kick the. Uh, oh, gads! I'm I'm blanking right now. The clutch. Uh, yeah, kick the clutch. Like really kick it to get into neutral, right? And so you know in that in the movie where Marty's actually like stomping um, the vehicle, right? You have yeah. to do that to drive the damn thing. So it drives more like a Sherman truck than it does a hot rod. Wow. A tank a Sherman tank. Excuse me. So I'll tell you straight, like I was terrified the whole time behind the wheel. I never took it above 40 um, because upshifting and downshifting is impossible. That's crazy. I, so you I, drove I, the DeLorean. That's awesome. Yeah, it was That's pretty so rad. That's so cool. That's also probably they do that so that people can't travel through time also. Because, you know, right. you can't, yeah. if you can't get it up to that speed, then you can't, it's, you know. Right. He keeps it safe. The joke that my wife and I have between us is that we chose the time machine as our getaway vehicle because we can always come back to that night. Oh. oh. <laughs> How sweet. Now that How you two sweet. have been trapped in a house together for a month, you still want to go back to that night? <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is that the guy came with our DeLorean and, I mean, first of all, it was pouring. Like, yeah. pouring. Yeah, it was bad. So, but we still got great pictures and she didn't know about the DeLorean. Oh, she knew about better. the Ecto, but she didn't know about the DeLorean. So the inside of the DeLorean was exactly that. The, the music and the, 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 the clock and the, the flux, flux capacitor, capacitor and yeah. the whole thing. It and then we went over to my car and we're like, let's go, let's get in the Ecto. And it was literally a shelled out. Oh, yeah. Like there's nothing in it. 
Yeah. It was like it was like dirty leather seats, barely a steering wheel. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's take the pictures outside. Fantasy. I had my proton pack with me. She had her her uh, hoverboard. Um, but so obviously, so these brands mean a lot to you. Yeah. Right. So just to kind of cap the the, the Funko bit of the conversation for now, um, like I was saying, there's a new Back to the Future set coming out, and included in that set, which we could talk about, I think, because it's public, <laughs> is uh, the first Biff. Right. Yeah. Which is a, a there's always been Doc and Marty. And so when that set came out, we were very excited because we love when they add a new character. But I think it's so it says so much about the company that they and I think you, from what I understand about who you are, that there's an understanding of what the fans want. Sure. And it's it's not like we're going to just keep making and shelling out the same things over and over again. At a certain point, you know that the people want Biff or you know that the people want the uh, key master and the gatekeeper, not just the four Ghostbusters. Like, I think that says so much about the company. So like, but just from your perspective, no, not even as an employee, from what you think, um, where do you think some of those decisions uh, come from like in the mind of like a person who says what makes you know that this is what we want to do this is we're going to do something different here and it's a it's a chance you're taking you know you don't know if that one's going to sell yeah but you do it anyway but what does it mean to you that the Mm. fans that that you get to work for a company and you get to have a hand in giving the fans what they really want yeah uh well so there was kind of like two things there i'll tackle the first thing first which was like how do we make those decisions and i'll tell you straight up um, it's fan first in every respect. So a lot of times it starts with somebody internally that's just a big old fan of something. So they're going to be able to understand compositionally what the DNA is of whatever this thing is that we're chasing, right? So if we're talking about Back to the Future, lo and behold, we've got 30 experts. We should pull the audience. Right. The, the other piece too, uh, no shame in saying as much, um, Brian Mariotti, who heads the company, he's very in tune with this stuff, right? And he's got his, his wants too. Um, and he knows um, inherently in many respects what, like, what the gravy is. Um, so, you know, that certainly weighs in on the decision making. Um, I think part of it, too, is also listening, right? So one thing that I truly admire about Funko is they do a lot of social listening. Um, and they actually do um, ask our fans to be vocal about what they want to see. Because ultimately that stuff does influence bigger decision making if and when we can incorporate it, right? So it's sort of a holy trinity of stuff, but I'll just tell you straight up that we're all about having fun, right? Um, and, and inherently we're about making the best decisions possible and making sure that um, our fans feel like they are plugged in because like what I try to tell friends and family, you know, what does Funko do? And keep in mind, this is just my opinion. Um, I have to sure. heavily caveat with bullshit mm-hmm. across the screen. Right. It's just my opinion, right? My opinion is, sure, we're a consumer products company. We make all sorts of different stuff uh, across Funko and Funko UK and Loungefly. But to me, the reality is Funko's primary export is community. We make things that really bind people together, lets them engage in a common form factor or a variety of common form factors. Um, and really, it's a feeling. We, we are, we're sort of um, putting ourselves in market saying that we have a real identity. You know, I'm not going to call out any other companies by name, but like you can really choose anything out there and, and ask anyone, what does it mean? Right. So like, uh, actually I'll, I'll, I'll choose something. When I say the word Lego, you have, you have an emotional reaction to what that is. You mm-hmm. understand what that means. Um, and kind of the qualitative value of that name. Right. And I personally love Lego. I'm a huge Lego fan. Um, but if I threw out an, another, company um and i'll i guess i'll choose one that's non-existent uh like toy biz or kenner um these things right. also have different relationships to you right so funko to me is a mu- as much like creating that feeling as it is actually creating products right well i think that comes through in the idea that you know you don't have to buy all of them you could have the one that represents you. Yeah. It connects to you. It makes you feel like you're being represented in your interest. Like Frank said, I mean, so a uh, Sigmund Freud or somebody like that is of interest to him. Mm-hmm. So if if that were to ever happen or you know whatever it is, 
he could get that one and go, I don't need to buy all of them. Right. Sure. I know that this company and this toy represents me and who I am. Yeah. Because also at the end of the day, they're so damn cute, right? So, right. So That's the other thing. that like ties everything together too, because it brings whatever sentimentality you have towards something. Right, which everyone brings their own set of, of memories to whatever, but then it also makes it cute the thing, right? Right. And it's it's like a it's like a home run. Like, man, if I can get my hands on a Houdini one, if you ever made that, I'd buy twelve. Like <laughs> right. oh my god. <laughs> well and, 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 and if I can add as on, much, please. so this is something that actually might um lean more on on Matt's interests or some of the plights that we've shared as as mutual fans of certain things. What I personally love about Funko is it's all your favorite stuff but it's all the same form factor and scale, right? So like, mm -hmm. it all lives coherently in one world. The features aren't different. The scale is not different. Like it's all uniform. I love that. Because that, that, that says that it's a respect on the other side. It, it is a respect for collectors. Sure. Like I said, they're accessible as a one-off. But as you said, I mean, they do all live together. I said this a couple of weeks ago on an episode that I love taking IPs that would, you'd never see together and putting them in the same space. Um, as a collector, that's sort of the most enjoyable thing for me. And even I, I know this and I, I, some people don't know these kind of little things, but like just in the idea that like the when when they first started, the Marvel ones and the Star Wars ones were bobbleheads. And now Funko doesn't, they're not bobbleheads anymore. The pops are not bobbleheads anymore, per se. But Marvel and Star Wars, they still are. Yeah. And that shows to me that there's a real respect for collector culture there as well. Yeah. So like that, and that's what you want. As a collector myself of various things, I can tell when a brand is respecting what I'm doing and wants to aid me in that hobby. It says that that hobby means something to them. Yeah. And so I think that builds into the the community of it as well. Jason's smile is either saying, damn, I love this guy, or shit, he drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, no, I'm kidding. No. Matt, Matt will be the first person to attest because we got to know each other when I was working on Power Rangers, right? Um, I, I am part of this culture and part of these cultures. I live and breathe this stuff. Um, I have nothing but profound respect for fans on the other side because honestly, I consider myself one of them. So, um, no, this is awesome. This is all just lovely, validating stuff. Right, absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to get into, Matt, your connection to brands, and one brand specifically that, Jason, you can also attest to and, and, and be a part of. But I think in order to do that, we, we need to go now take a step backwards. You said that you ended up working for these companies, and there was somewhere in there you said... You wanted to be an engineer, uh, uh, an Imagineer, yeah, right. Which um, we can relate to here as well, because Danielle, um, yeah, I'm a I'm a creative. I mean, I'm I'm an artist and yeah. an illustrator, so I've always loved Disney. I've never wanted to be like an animator, but it just the culture is looking at the Disney. Imagineer stuff. It's hard when you're when you're a designer and you're like, I want to do this, and then you see like, oh well, I have to be an engineer also. Like, so <laughs> Um, but so then you said, lo and behold, I ended up working for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. It's the lo and behold that I want to kind of talk about. <laughs> sure. Bit, right. Um, you have a love for these brands. Yeah. Where, why is it, do you think that we connect to these brands? Because then I'm going to tie this into how you pursued your love for it. Yeah. To be able to make it your life. Yeah which I think is something that we all want to achieve and a lot for a lot of people it seems implausible, yeah. you know? So you kind of go back to the psychological reason why we all connect to these brands, right? Yeah. Um, why is it you think that, that these, let's say Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, Ghostbusters, whatever it is that, you know, we all love Batman. Some people brush them off as like, silly entertainment and yeah. then some people look at it as this is my life is there a difference what's the difference why do you think that we connect to them and certain people don't and you know and jason we watched your ted talk okay cool which that's a whole other thing right <laughs> so we we saw the we saw the 20 minute version of this answer 
Yeah. Okay. Good. Of good. Course, good. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> um, thanks for watching. That's awesome. That's very lovely, uh, and and uh, much appreciated. Um, okay. So, how do I answer this question? There's a couple things. I really, I really think that we as a generation, because I kind of look at the, the faces in, in the room, so to speak, we're sort of of like age, I would imagine. We're probably the, the 25 to 35 plus crowd. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, awesome. So we are the byproduct. We are technically what I would consider to be like generation three of like fandom fandom, right? So um, generation one would actually be probably more like your classic Trek, um, you know, sort of late sixties Trek. Um, and then that codified and concreted, of course, with Star Wars, which became a cultural revolution, right? So it piggybacked on many of like the things that had led into its influence, a lot of interest in like pulp serials, of course, or um, things like Flash Gordon, it certainly took ideas um, from all of these genres uh, and the atomic age of the 50s, and it, it became its own moment in time, right? And so we'll call Star Wars kind of generation two. And why I think that's important is it helped bind a lot of bigger ideas. It helped bind this idea that like storytelling exists between a, a multitude of different facets. So it exists between the actual content itself the relationship to the people consuming it, the consumer products, and sort of the web that exists between all of these things, right? And more importantly, it exists in the, the imagination of, um, it exists in the imagination of the kids that are actually recreating and building new stories with, with this tactile play, right? So we'll call that generation two. Generation three is basically us, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, all of these kids that were prone um, to the learnings of generation one and two, and you had all these companies that were like, well, good content is good content. Also, we can build stuff that, that leans into why these things are successful. So you had like basically the birth of the 80s as we know it um, a, across a, a broad spectrum of, of stuff, right? Right. So, gosh... Man, I'm, I'm down a rabbit hole here. But what Please, let's go. I can tell you is, what I can tell you is, or what I believe, is that, honestly, the perfect stuff was engineered for us to consume it. We were recognized for the first time as a viable audience in like the late 80s and early 90s as kids sure. came together for the first time on television, right outside of Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. um, be, and because of that, Things were created for us and things were created in response to us. Um, we had a place to belong. Um, and this was like pre-internet. And I think that's one thing that I want to emphasize is pre-internet, these places felt a little sacred to us. And then also, um, this shit was awesome, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like it's sort of yes. like niche, right? Before the internet, it was like if you were – which is why I think a lot of the older generation kind of brushes it off as like silly nothing is because you, if you were into these things, you were the outside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now the outside is the inside. It's the inside. Right? Yeah. Right. But also what you said, Jason, like, I like from a, like a psychological standpoint, like when kids are young and they have like, I had like the Ninja Turtle set, I had the Batman, um, it was like the building that would like break apart when he like fell through the roof and the skylight would come in. You were the like, the little god of that world when you played with yeah. it, right? And this was like, there's an expression that like play is the serious business of childhood. Yeah. Like that was like, you were going to work, you were playing with your stuff. I, and I think that's why we link so intimately to these concepts when we're older, because that was like our first taste of magic and of having some power and having some control and having a world where it was like our thing. Right. You, know? you could write that story. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, well, and just as much. So I've done both collectibles and I've done mass market toys. And when you're doing mass market toys specifically for kids, a word that you hear thrown around a lot is aspirational play or aspirational characters. Right. So why that's so important is as people are building these things, they want to create quote unquote role models within those environments, because in many cases, kids are going to be looking to this content to not only um, 
find cool whiz bang effects, whatever it may be, but ultimately to find pieces and parts of themselves that they want to borrow and then bake into their adult identity, right? And so it's important that these characters are, um, they're morally complex, right? But that they have a point of view. Um, and it's also important in many respects that these worlds are vast enough that people can find themselves in it, right? So, sure. Right. Um, so it, I guess this has all just been longhand, but if I were to give it to you shorthand, I think really what these things mean to us is these are different ways by which we identify ourselves, right? So like I can tell you that, yep, Ghostbusters and Back to the Future and, and Power Rangers and these things are funnel, fundamentally a part of who I am. But more importantly, if I were to tell you that I'm a Leonardo, right? You'd be like, <laughs> bro, I know who right. you are. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, like, you're yeah. the lawful good, you know, you really hate breaking the rules. You really kind of, you feel obligated, to, you know, whatever it is. So right. it's become cultural shorthand for us. And it's it's also become self-expression. Right. And it's right. I, it's so fascinating when you look at something like Comic-Con. Yeah. Has taken, or, the, or any of these conventions, you know, they've taken on such a life of their own because it gives people who didn't have a place to fit in somewhere they can find yep. like connection. Yeah. You know? Um, now, I've, like, Matt, I, I've, I've known you since we were five years old. You know, we've been best friends for 25 years. Um, you have always connected to Power Rangers. Right. You know, specifically, I will say Power Rangers is in the American version of Power Rangers, I will say right now, right? When I was your age, when we were kids together, so was I. So was everybody else. And then they moved on to other things. And you also moved on to other things, but you kept that thing, which then happened to me when I saw Ghostbusters or whatever. I moved on to other things, but that one spoke to me. W and so where does that, what does it mean to you as a fan? What is that brand? Again, you can go into the differences between American Power Rangers and the, you know, the original Super Sentai and the whole, you know, where, where sure. but as a, what it encapsulates is why do you connect to it? Because that's what, that's what I want your purpose here to be. You be the person for sure. to speak to that, you know? For sure. So for me, Power Rangers, either version, American, Japanese, uh, what have you. I, as a kid, and still now, I was very antisocial growing up. True. I um, can say that. Still, anti still antisocial. <laughs> more, um, more, true I'm, I'm better, more true now. Right. I'm better uh, than I was. For me, as a kid, Power Rangers was my home. I have a very loving family and, and everything, but Power Rangers was a world that I could disappear into and not have to worry about me. I could just be there. It was, you know, everybody on Power Rangers is kind of perfect and happy and there's bad things that happen, but everything is really resolved at the end of the half an hour episode. So it's a lot simpler than dealing with life stuff and anxiety and, and all that other stuff. So sure. that, that initially connected it to me. Um, then eventually I just kind of got into the whole Japanese culture thing when I found out that Power Rangers originated in Japan. Uh, and so that led me to the Japanese side of things. And I ended up picking up Japanese and that's how I kind of found my career outside of acting with the Japanese language and stuff. So I connect to it from that uh, aspect too, because I use the Japanese version as like a learning textbook in a way. Sure, um, of course. So those, those two ends of the spectrum. I remember sitting there watching Abba Ranger, I think it was, yep. which was yep. then Dino mm -hmm. Thunder. There you go. There you, you, go. Got, you got it right on Yep, it. that's right. Uh, but I remember watching Abba Ranger with you without subtitles. And yeah. just sitting and we'd watch like every episode. I'd come over and we'd watch it. I had no idea what was going on because <laughs> I didn't speak Japanese. Right. And you would right. just tell me what was happening. But that was you learning the language yeah. through your love for the brand. Yeah. Hey Matt. So I'm I'm Hey Matt, by the way. That's a good friend, man. That's a really good friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean that was a that was yeah. a particularly great season. I really enjoyed it. I ended up really enjoying it. <laughs> Yeah, John, what was your favorite line from that season? Yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> but I do remember, I mean, I remember I remember a lot of it. I remember the whole the whole through line of the whole season. I remember it so much so that I remember watching the American version and enjoying it very much. 
but being able to pinpoint what was different story changes from the American version of the story to the Japanese version of the story. And also, uh, and I'm sure Matt will kind of back me up here, It all, Abba Ranger also contains arguably the most violent death on screen ever of a, oh, in boy. anything. Yeah. Oh boy. Sure. I mean, I have nothing to compare it to, but I what remember it, it being pretty violent in the first place. Uh, so the white, the white ranger and Abba Ranger, who is was a bad a guy, fantastic for most of character, best character, very one, one of my favorite characters, like morally gray, he hyper is, morally gray, morally gray, super <laughs> morally gray. He's a bit of a sociopath. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the series, he turns to the side of good, kind of, sorta, and he dies. But the way that he dies is that all the wounds that he's ever had open up at once. Uh, and it's it's the bloodiest thing I've ever seen on on children's television. Oh yeah, it's they go for ho- it. horrifying. Yeah, they go for it. it. That's a if I recall idea, correctly, though. it's yeah. on a beach. Yeah, he's on a beach, and then he flies off on his on his sword and explodes. Yeah, he just um, starts. It's very very beautiful, bleeding from every but, but blood imaginable. And he his he's got he's a he's a doctor, so he's got a white outfit. So the blood is just very, very stark against the, the sure. war outfit. Right. Beautiful thing. And then he that's, takes I off mean, on the sword season. and blows up, which is yep. actually the way my grandfather went. Oh. Which is really... <laughs> he was a good man. Sorry. <laughs> a plumber, a oh. hard worker. He rode in the sky with his weapon <laughs> yeah. first before he did. But that's I, I guess I guess that's also and maybe uh, maybe this probably plays the same for Jason as well. I I associate or I relate to Power Rangers and, and Super Sentai. I have a certain sense of humor. Um, that's sure, a little bit sure. on the absurd. And Power Rangers Sentai kind of goes between being dramatic, but also melodramatic, and then also kind of hyper comedy and also hyper drama. So it hits both sides of the spectrum for me. So it's interesting, right? Because this kind of plays into the broader conversation. All of these things mean common things to certain people. And in some respects, they mean entirely other things as well, right? So, um, What stood out to me when Matt was talking about it was he found a sense of belonging, right? He found a sense of community. um, And those things are very valid, certainly in in your experience um, and and for many others. For me, it was a little different, I'll be honest. So Power Rangers, yep, those those things hit for me, you know, and I I love the the dynamic of um, you could be a superhero with your best friends. And if anything, that was the piece that I pulled out for myself as I was constantly imagining myself and my best friends being that perfect superhero team and, and constantly loving and supporting one another. Right. But the thing that really stood out to me about Rangers was that it was, it was the kitchen sink, right? It was monsters and magic and technology and time travel. And like, yeah, sure. All of these things were constantly being interwoven and I'll be honest, and as I look back and I think of myself in retrospect, I feel like I was constantly looking over my shoulder going like, are, are you seeing this? Like, <laughs> they're, ac- they're actually doing this, you know? Like, this is, cr- this is crazy. Um, and I think the thing that really stood out to me was intentional or not, there was a lot of connective tissue between these characters, um, good guy, bad guy, and then season to season. And it wasn't always it wasn't always made obvious, but as the seasons went on, it, it started to feel like we've got a living, breathing universe, which ultimately became part of sort of the latter part of my career, it became part of my job to help bind these things together and introduce new new mythology with a team. Let me be clear, it wasn't me doing exclus- doing it exclusively, but we had some pretty incredible folks on the team and we were constantly throwing out these bigger ideas of like, how do we take all of those little sinews of ideas and bind them all together to make an one organized universe that will sort of self-service itself indefinitely? But sure. It is interesting to hear that for Matt, it was something way more intense and way more um, emotional and social. And for me, it was more, and, and I'm, that's not to say you didn't feel these things as well, Matt, but for me, it was also more about like, the sheer attraction and the audacity of what it was. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, even I still, Matt will send me things. He knows what to send me. Yeah. When when there's stuff that's continuity based, that like, oh, they referenced this from four seasons ago or this character from X, Y, and Z shows up, he knows that I'll watch that episode. Yeah. Like, just because I'm a continuity junkie. That's yeah. like my thing. Um, but it's fascinating to me that in the two of your p- 
paths crossed because you were a fan with power, so to speak, <laughs> because you because you worked for the company, right? <laughs> yep. You were yeah. a fan with power mm-hmm. on one end. Yeah. And Matt was a fan with power on the other end. Yeah. Because Matt is is right at the front of of I don't want to say he because he's going to tell me it's not true, but Matt's towards the front of the community in a lot of ways. Yeah. On the social side of it, mm-hmm. so the fact that you guys were able to cross over and register that, like, oh no, the company and the fans are trying to work together to create the best possible product. Yeah, and I think it goes back to the the collection stuff I was saying before. That that just shows a fan that the people care, and I think that's so it's so important. Yeah, you know. Well, and you know, if I can say as much. Um, there is a kind of this. This may seem sacrilegious for a second, and I, I don't intend it to. Um, and I have no problem saying I'm a person of faith, so please take this with a grain of salt. But there's a kind of religiosity um, in the in the composition of these worlds because they've grown so well beyond their original intent, right? Um, because they've become cultural movements unto themselves. They're not just a, a contained story, and so if you compare the history as you look at some of the bigger organized religions, um, you know, you have things where ideas would disseminate amongst the people. And then ultimately we'd have to come back and there would be organized groups like the council of worms or whatever that would debate what was canonical and non-canonical or canonical and apocryphal. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and then it has to be validated, validated against, um, the annals of history and it has to be validated against uh, first-hand accounts or second-hand accounts, you know, and that's ultimately what led to certain texts and whatever. The reason I share that is because it perfectly illustrates that the idea is so much bigger than the owner. The idea actually belongs to the people. And now we're talking about America folks. No, but, um, <laughs> but the, the, the idea, the idea really does belong to the people and, um, and, and, these things have to move forward, but on the same token, there is a symbiotic relationship with the audience. And so uh, it's critical to integrate folks, you know, and it's critical to hear what they love or don't love and listen um, and adjust accordingly. And so working on Rangers was like some of the best years of my career so far because I've, I've had an opportunity to meet wonderful people like Matt. Um, right. And, and really, and I mean this in the truest sense of the word, and work with them, right? Because right. Um, I got to know the community very well. Uh, I've always been a part of the community, let's be real, but I got to know the community from a different angle very well. And uh, I'll tell you, there isn't, there isn't folks that are more dedicated or more passionate than, than fans. And they're willing to do untold amounts of, um, of work and effort to make sure that the thing that they love survives or grows or becomes bigger you know and so how could you not leverage that excitement and energy anyway right no jason you're absolutely right have you ever had a piece of fan fiction get sent to you and then and then with permission or whatever like incorporated ideas from fan fiction into actual writing so that is a tricky question because let's be real legally speaking you cannot accept unsolicited ideas uh sure and then exploit them right right there are different examples of um, of riffing on ideas that have existed or theories that have existed in fandom for a while or open questions, right? Mm. Um, so like, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, years ago, uh, we there was an episode of, of Super Megaforce, right? That depicted um, Tommy using powers that we had not explained how he had reacquired, right? It was just kind of out there. Um, he was using both green and white powers and everybody was like, how does this even work? Because the last time that we saw him, he was Dr. O, the black dino thunder ranger. Right. 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 And so we did dimensions in danger like two years ago and therein lied an opportunity to actually explain it from a lore perspective. Right. So we knew that there was an open question there. People had raised the concern that there was, um, there was an inconsistency of the history and so we decided to tackle it head-on and introduce new lore and new mythology that directly addressed that so um yep 
we do that we do that all the time it's just it comes down to finding the right and organic ways to do it that don't break the law i love you i love you <laughs> <laughs> like things like that make you feel so good that you know that somebody's listening when i watch star wars and they come out with something that makes no sense I feel like I'm crazy when I turn around and I go, that doesn't make any sense. Then they fix it and I go, oh, so were they listening or is it by chance? Mm. Like, do the people who are creating it actually follow the story as closely as I do or as an X, Y, and Z fan sure. does? And it's nice to know that they do. And here's what I can tell you. The answer is yes. Right. Like, especially when you're playing with these big worlds that mean so much to people, this stuff is just going to happen. Right. Because let's be real when you're making content, especially big, like big studio, capital S studio content, whether it be comics or movies or television shows or whatever, the one thing that's often not seen um, by fans or just the community in general is there are infinite rounds of politics and business decisions. And yeah, like, there's a whole multitude of stuff that you just do not see in creating these things. Personalities, like you wouldn't believe. It takes a lot to navigate these worlds when you're building new stuff against them. And so this stuff happens, it just happens, right? Sometimes you, you swing and you miss. Other times you listen, you address it. Or other times you have to, by necessity, push the fandom forward. You have to push the ideas forward and keep them fresh or engaging. So I can tell you, um, people do listen. Uh, and, and, you know, it's case by case. Not every studio is built the same way. Not every brand has the same people or advocates working for it. You know, there's constantly big, big things that are happening, like right now, um, in the world in general, that changes who's working on stuff and when and why. But I can tell you, for the most part, nowadays, people really care. Um, and they, and if they are in those positions of authority, um, like I have a dear friend that works at Lucasfilm, um, I will not reveal their identity, but they do work in the story group. Right. Okay. Um, sure. dear friend of mine, super wonderful person could not love star Wars more with every bone in their body. Um, and man, do they care and they listen, right. And they adjust yeah. accordingly and they build new stuff. And sometimes that's the thing is the other thing that I have to sort of illustrate is not everything is for everybody, but everything is for somebody. Sure. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you are not being fed, let's say in the movies, I'm not talking about star Wars. I'm just talking in general, anything fed right. in the movies. That's okay. Because there's going to be another expression that will feed you, whether it be novelizations or comics or just even the cultural currency of hanging out and, and hang, you know, doing cool stuff with fans. Like, wearing a Marty McFly costume to Comic-Con and talking to people, right? Like, there's so many ways for you to express yourself and there's so many ways for you to consume and never forget you can always go back to the things that meant most to you and revisit those things over and over again and, and find the nuances that really, like, spoke. So I'm getting right. long-winded, but... I got to clap for that right now. Sorry. No, that's true. <laughs> It's true. I want to go back, Jason. Take me back. Yeah. Well, we've got a time machine, brother. Let's do it. <laughs> there you go. Well, I, can I just can I just piggyback on that very quickly? Um, I think a perfect example of that, and Jason, you may agree with me. If you don't agree with me, you can plead the fifth, okay? Uh, like you said, everything, not everything is for everybody, but everything is for, there's something for somebody, right? Yeah. So, like, I am a huge Ghostbusters fan. Yes, as am I. Me. I will anything I'm in. Okay. The 2016 female reboot uh, came out and I loved it. Yeah. Was it perfect? No. Do I just want people who care about the, f do I want more of what I love? Of course. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't like it and that's cool. Fine. But we loved it. Yeah. And like, I'll take more. It like doesn't take away from the other ones exactly. that were there. It's just more. Back. Like you said, you can go back, and I yeah. gladly will. And I will go back to that one also. Yeah. And, and, like, I, and also I, I, think I, I do it all the time. And um, I, do like, uh, I do like the 2016 film quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
And if you do not recognize Holtzman as like a turning point in society, then um, you're completely blind, right? Like right? Holtzman, <laughs> Holtzman is amazing for a multitude of reasons, but um, for me at least, she's she's the standout piece of stuff that comes out of the 2016 film, right? Sure, of course, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm not I'm not gonna lie, I, I love the film, uh, and I had dinner next to Melissa McCarthy. Um, accident at a local restaurant like a year and a half ago and the whole time i just kept thinking like i'm having dinner next to a ghost this is so awesome uh, yeah absolutely nailed it what yes. did she order jason <laughs> i uh, to be fair i wasn't at dinner with her i was just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so can we play our first game are we ready jason what we're gonna do is play a game we play on every episode it's called the rating game okay okay Super I'll give easy. It a five. S- s- that's basically how it works, <laughs> but it also exactly has right. no. It has no rules. Okay. So, I have a topic of things, and you have to rate. You're going to be rating the following things from our childhoods. Okay. okay? Yeah. Because you seem to be the expert on all things childhood, and as oh, they no. transition I'm into adulthood, not an expert, just a fellow pilgrim. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, what do you want to rate them in? You come up with the matrix. It's one to ten. What? Cats. Perfect. One to ten cats. I okay. love this. I think our, our, the way we should segue into this game, everybody, is I think we should all together make putty sounds. That should transition us into the game. Can we do that? Perfect. Sure. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Jason, please rate the following things from our childhood. Some of them might be a bit more personal than you'd like them to be. Sure. Okay. Number one, Jason, please rate when I would have nightmares from watching Are You Afraid of the Dark on SNCC. <laughs> Are, are you asking me to rate the nightmares? When I would have nightmares, please rate that, Jason. Oh, or the. Uh, are you talking about a specific episode of. Jason, I'm talking about when I would have nightmares from Are You Afraid of the Dark? Okay, if you want to be specific, when the kid was trapped in the mall. You had nightmares about Are You Afraid of the Dark? I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I still watched it every Saturday night. Yeah, I love Are You Afraid of the Dark? So I'm going to give. So how do you rate my nightmares? I rate your nightmares at six cats, two kittens. <laughs> yeah yeah okay that's fine no, no I, I was gonna say seven cats one kitten but we're basically yeah six or one half a dozen of another okay um john do you want to take the second one yeah okay. um tamagotchis three cats wow okay although they recently did just recently recently bondi japan released uh evangelion versions um of tamagotchi so you can actually raise an angel from like nothing to full angel status so i'm gonna say the evangelion version is like seven cats so So you can raise it from lucifer to saint michael like you go all you take it yeah (laughs) well let's be real right like a tamagotchi monster is just like it's just a thing right yeah and it's pixelated in pixel thing but (laughs) evangelion that's cool Well, so that's weird like a kaiju that's going to decimate humanity from a pseudo right they just like weird pseudoscience yeah like it gets way cooler so that's weird because in that one the goal is to become an angel and in the regular tamagotchi if you become an angel it means you've lost it yes yeah that's very interesting all right frank next one yeah all right you're you ready jason yeah okay please rate the following things from our childhoods my best friend renee goldfarb in childhood constantly making me feel like shit because she was way better at the skip it (laughs) wow renee in her driveway you know renee was pretty damn good at skip it she was very good at skip it i'm I'm gonna say four cats one kitten you're too generous you're too generous you're too generous that gets nothing nothing he's still hurting he's still hurting from it but he's he's ignoring the olympic level of skip it that was yeah i agree i was really good at skip it so i you should have seen a gold farm you should have seen a bop it you were good at the bop it, Danielle? Absolutely not. Cool. No, no, not? Okay. okay <laughs> that bop it always yelled at me. Um, <laughs> all right. The next one. Straight up. Nosebleeds. Uh, I don't, luckily, I don't have them. I'm going to give it zero cats. There's there you go. one in nosebleeds. I've never There's, had one. This schnozzle has never bled. You've mm. never had a nosebleed? Nope. What? Nope. Danielle sometimes I used to like get them, turn, I used like to turn get them on a constantly. faucet. I, I got it last. I got one last week. Yeah, Matt, used to, <laughs> Matt did used to used get to them bad, a lot as kids. Bad. Matt did get them a lot. Yeah, 
I remember once I was in class and I sneezed and blood came out of my nose all over my paper. Anyway, moving on. It's all trauma. <laughs> it's all trauma. That's why I want a Sigmund Freud uh, Funko Pop. Okay. Jason, how do you rate this from childhood? Legends of the Hidden Temple, The Shrine of the Silver Monkey, Feet, Body, Head. Why were those kids those kids so dumb? I'm a big fan of Olmec and his temple, so I'm going to... Sure. Say, man, that's like... It was a three-piece puzzle, okay? The bottom one had feet sticking up, the yeah. other one had hands sticking feet, body, down, head. the top yeah. one was a head. Yeah. Why so hard? Seven, seven cats, five kittens. Seven cats, five kittens. But wow. you agree it was not as hard as those kids made it out to be. No, no, of course not. But you also, were under the gun. Those temple guards, you were nervous. forget it. Could you temple imagine the temple guards, guards in the dressing room, like getting this stuff on, like, mm, we're going to grab some kids. This is crazy, right? <laughs> well, that was their job. In, inversely, their job. inversely, it makes me think of um, Double Dare, right? Like, who was yeah. the production assistant that had to go and stuff the nose? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yep. So, oh, oh, yeah. Of course we know what you're talking about. But and here, that here's the thing. Our next one. Here's the thing. Everybody's all like, oh, Legends of the Hidden Temple or Double Dare, but nobody talks about Nick Arcade, and I was all about Nick Arcade. Uh, I love um, Nick Arcade was the best, and nobody it. talks about it. You're absolutely right. Nobody Nick knows Arcade. it Everyone exists. forgets it. It was on at like 6 a.m. Yeah, it was on, yeah. Now, like, here, here's the sad truth. To us at home, awesome. To the kids in the, in the studio, they were against a green screen like... Yeah, well, right, that's yeah. right. In open Jump. air, jumping at I nothing. Think, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> yeah. do you know what drive me drove me bananas about Nick Arcade? The host, when he would pronounce Doctor Robotnik, would say Doctor Robonik. No, yo, you bet me. Find those tapes. <laughs> at least he was trying. Now he's just Eggman. I give that Please. three cats. Three cats. Oh, three cats. All right, three that cats. brings us okay. to the next one, which is the physical challenge. Ooh, do physical we like challenge? It? I like the physical challenge. Yeah. Hear the music right now. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do, do. Uh, of course. Eight cats. Yeah, eight cats. Yes. Love I make Danielle challenge. walk around the house with clear bowls on her head so I could just try to throw stuff in. <laughs> do you want to know something funny? Uh, we've been doing this show for almost a year now. we got uh, a little over three seasons Congratulations. Uh, into it. And um, after our very first recording, the second person that we asked to be on the show was Mark Summers. Right. Oh, awesome. We left, we left right. a voicemail on his – We our guests knew him, and so called him right after the recording and was like, this was really fun. You should do it. And then we never pursued it because we didn't really want to bother him, and we hadn't even had one released show yet. But, yeah, we did call Mark Summers. Amazing. That's right. I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Weird. Okay, so the next one is very specific, but it seems that you like Nickelodeon game shows as much as us, so you're going to know what this is. Jason, please rate whenever a Nickelodeon kids game show gave a bicycle as a prize and they always advertised it as with the ability to stop on a dime. <laughs> you know I'm right. You know I'm right and you haven't heard it in 25 years. So that is true. I have not heard that in 25 years. I'm going to give that. That's a great feature. Oh, they always said it. That's with easily. The ability to stop on a dime. That's easily 43 kittens. And here's the thing. <laughs> Here's the thing. I will admit, though, I'm a little bit in the pocket of Nick because when I was like 10, I I won a first prize in a call-in sweepstakes on Nickelodeon and oh. a Sega Genesis 32X. Yes. And a copy of Bubsy and an RFID controller, a wireless controller. So Wow. Let's be real. I mean like... They gave you a copy of Bubsy. That sounds like you might have lost on that one. <laughs> sounds like you might have lost. I played Bubsy. the shit out of that Bubsy. <laughs> so did some I. free Bubsy. Let's Do be you real. Know, I, I played so much Bubsy, and I played Bubsy 64, and I was so into it, and it took me until I was 30 years old to realize what a garbage game. <laughs> and I, I hate to say that because they're still making them, and I would still pay to buy it. If yep. you told me where to get it, I think it's on the Switch. I would pay ten dollars for Bubsy. Yes, oh, Bubsy. but it's oh, so boy. bad. We need a Bubsy pop. Um. Um, while we're on the wait, while we're on the Nickelodeon uh, idea for a second, the 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 first time in my life as a child, I remember feeling guilt because it all goes back to trauma for me. Was when they had Nickelodeon's big helpathon, and if you called and pledged how much time you were willing to help, you would talk to a Nickelodeon celebrity. So I called. And I didn't get a celebrity, and I pledged two hours, and it sat on my chest for so long because I knew I didn't help anybody for two hours. I'm just wow. confessing it now. I'm just Here's confessing the deal, it now. Frank. 
you still can. No, no, no. <laughs> so, no. If, but, but if Summer Sanders had answered that phone. <laughs> if Summer Sanders. You no. know I would have helped. No, but Frank, you, you think that was guilty. How about me sitting at home that one day a year? I think it might have been Earth Day, which is today we're recording, where they would turn off Nickelodeon for the day and put up that, like, go outside and play. And Nick I would just play. sit there. Yeah, and I would cool sit idea. there and stare at it and go, what am I going to watch today? <laughs> 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 I, you want to talk guilt? I used to sit there and watch it on repeat and be like, "What am I gonna do? I'm not gonna go outside. That's for sure. I know that." Um, all right, last one. Last one. Last one. Salute your shorts versus "Hey, dude." Oh, salute your shorts all the way. Yeah, um, exactly. that's that's like easily nine cats, right? Yeah, yeah. we like that one. Clear. I can we uh, I can say the lyrics verbatim from. Let's do it right now. We run, we jump, we swim and play. We row and grow on chips, uh, uh, go on trips. But the things that last forever, your friendships. That's right. I wanna. Oh no, we hold you. We hold in you in our hearts. hearts. And when, when I, I think, think about, about you, you it makes, makes me wanna. wanna. Yes. Okay, we're good. Hang on, I don't wanna. Hang on, I don't wanna. Okay, we so did good. it. So good. Yeah. That was the rating, rating game. game. Yay, rating game. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Pretty cool. You did good. Yeah. That was so funny. So <laughs> I want to talk about Frank real quick. Seriously? Uh, I, yeah, because oh. uh, I am a, I, I'm a fan. I know what I'm. I know what I'm a fan of. I know what I'm not. I am identified in a lot of ways by some of these IPs. Danielle is the same. Matt is the same. Jason, you would include yourself as part of the same. Yeah. Frank is the kind of person who doesn't. Wait. Okay. No. No. Okay. Let me. Let me. So Fine. like. I'm Frank is fan of things. He likes things, yeah. but like the geek culture or nerd culture doesn't necessarily permeate with you in a lot of the same ways it does with other people. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I mean, I would go to Comic Con and probably have fun. Of but I don't think I would know what most of the things there were. Right, we still go. But so I that I I subscribe to the idea that it's not so much that you are not or people like you. Now we can get off of you who don't necessarily identify with said brands as you know so strongly it's not that they're not affected by them they just don't understand it sure. that's that, that that's my belief cuz everybody's got to be fans of something you have to like something you have things you like and don't like you know but why is it that that some people are so quick to brush it brush it off or sweep it under the rug or you know, like we said before, we talked a lot before about how people, especially now, are very proud to be fans. What about the people who are not at all of X, Y, and Z? Like, God bless them, right? Like, the reality is um, we, we, John, are a complex human animal, right? Right, right. Even though we may not find ourselves uh, at home in some of these other expressions of art, who's to say that we don't find ourselves in other kinds of facets of art entirely. So, you know, I know folks that are all about music. Music is their bread and butter. They are defined by the things that they listen to, the artists that they follow. Um, I know other people that are just as geeked up about finance or the stock market or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, uh, or legitimately just being a good, decent human being and loving on their families or what, you know, like, that's the thing that's so lovely about all of this is just because you can't express yourself through other people's expressions doesn't mean that you're any less valid. Um, it just means that you're a differently built animal and something to be appreciated in a different way. That's very fair. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's obvious that like, of course it's, you know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's just, I just find it so interesting because, you know, Frank and I are very close and like, we couldn't be very, couldn't be more different in that way. You know, like I, I think, uh, I think growing up though, if like, if, if having an affiliation to a, a, a cultural something which gives you this feeling of sentimentality and belonging and community, for me, it was I was a, a, a thousand and one percent obsessed with magic, not the gathering, magic, like magic tricks, David yeah, Copperfield. Blue Eyes, White Dragon, or whatever it was that, Yu Gi Oh! actually. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, I would tape every single magic show i would watch them on repeat till i could figure them out i would go to the magic store in manhattan for my birthday and for christmas and i would spend hours there there with the guy behind the counter he would show me the tricks and like that for me is my that gives me that same feeling now if you were like yeah. hey you want to meet david copperfield i'd be like ah, i'd freak out like that would do it for me i think 
Um, but it's not necessarily, I don't really have that affiliation. You're right though, with like a Batman thing or, or Ninja Turtles, even though I had all that stuff and I like them, I don't, they haven't, I haven't carried them through into my personality now so, as an adult. This story is for Frank. It lasts only a minute long. My wife and I were in Vegas two years ago with family around the holidays. Um, we were, we, uh, went and visited, um, Siegfried and Roy's like mad, like magical garden or whatever, just something to do during the day. Right. And I had made this really terrible joke as we were looking at the white tiger. I was like, hmm, <clears throat> I wonder if that's where they keep, they, they keep um, Siegfried, right? <laughs> not. I kid you not. Kim, my wife and I turn around and Siegfried is right there in front of us. And he introduces himself and he welcomed us to his garden and he pulled a coin out of Kim's ear, and it was the shit most magical thing I've ever seen in my life. He <laughs> no way. There. It was, it was, did, you know, did he hear you? Very cool. No, 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 no. He was just, it was like the most opportune serendipity. <gasps> That's, That's magic. That's it magic. was magic. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's funny. It. But it's like, so, Frank, you're watching the Marvel movies now. I am. Right? And I don't want to mm-hmm. get into any spoiler territory. Because mm-hmm. you're only about halfway through, mm-hmm. but like you're finding, you're enjoying them, right? Yeah, can I you, call, yeah. No, can ahead. you see what people are pulling out? People who are like obsessed and love those characters and that the, the yeah. cinematic versions of those characters. You oh, could yeah. see where that fandom is growing from. Absolutely. And I called. I, I had called John. I mean, nobody knows this, but John. I called John uh, two nights ago because John had said to me, "Here's the list. Watch all the Marvels. You have nothing. You're home, right?" So my wife and I, every day, every two days, we've been watching one after another. I said to him, I called him, I said, they're brilliant. The way these writers, and I know they're all different writers, they're interlocking and interweaving all these plots is masterful. Like, it's crazy the way they're doing it. So I I do have that appreciation for it. And yeah, the characters are super cool. You can relate somehow to everybody, you know? They're sort of archetypal, um, you know. I, yeah, I do. I think I think they're amazing. So where, found where are you now in your watch party? We just finished Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, right. So, so we're like right Avengers in the two. Avengers two. We're gonna not, start. Not quite at Captain America Winter Soldier yet. Yes. No. We just saw Winter Soldier. Oh. Which I thought was so there's, far to me one of the best ones. There's so much beauty beyond that, but you have to know that you have reached the summit. That's a lot of people's favorite. Yeah. A lot of Winter Soldier, favorite. right? Yeah, I have yeah. to say though, I I liked Guardians of the Galaxy, but I could have done without it. It was like ah, it was all right. It was you, after it, Winter Soldier to me was a masterpiece, and then Guardians of the Galaxy was like Chris Pratt from The Office making like shit jokes. So I was like, <laughs> I get it. I like Chris Pratt. Well, the, was, whole, like, <laughs> the whole idea came from Danielle suggesting that we have a when this is all done a Marvel party where yeah. everyone comes as a hero, and then it came from oh yeah we haven't. Frank's never seen these movies because Doctor Strange is a biopic of Frank. <laughs> so we haven't mm. gotten, we haven't gotten there it really yet. Is, though. Do you see it? Yeah. See the and the goatee, the it's Grace all coming together. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we're waiting what, for him. What does he do? He floats? What is that? Yeah, yeah. Strange we're do? waiting for him to get to that one. I didn't get up to it yet. We're really waiting for him to get to that one. Amazing. Um but so he's right. I mean, there are different writers and all these things and they know the characters' voices. Which which takes me to kind of one of the the last things I want to touch on because i know frank has one more game and then i think we're gonna try to put a bow on it but um jason you've done a decent amount of writing and story editing for some things as well yeah for for things like ninja turtles and uh power rangers and a couple of other um wonder char- woman i don't want to say yeah my wife and i yeah. <clears throat> my wife and i wrote an issue of wonder woman so how do you as a writer how do you grasp these characters' voices, these iconic characters? Like in these films, they're they're writing all this different people writing different characters, but they get yeah. a grasp of the voice. As someone who's had experience, how do you get the voice right? Do you think it's a lovely question? Everybody's going to have a different answer to it. Of course, of course. Uh, for me, it's a bit of a spooky thing right it's compositionally understanding who the character is knowing where you want to go and then giving them a voice giving them a chance to actually speak for themselves um so for me it's a it's a bit of an out-of-body thing right where 
the words just come to mind. You're actually, and I'm sure Frank could explain it in, in much more um, eloquent uh, psychological terms, but it's almost like you are bisecting your, your mind. There is, there is the present cognizant sense of self, and then there is a other portion, a, a well of um, human expression that you're just giving voice to. So um, that, that's just been my experience, right? It's not like I hear multi, a multitude of voices and I'm giving them a host on the page or anything like that, but I'm giving them a chance, at least the version that I've created in my mind, I'm giving them a chance to express themselves. Right, and being a fan, I imagine it it's helps out because you know Leonardo would say this or he wouldn't say that. Like, yeah. you know, you can have an idea, I think, and we can all, in some way, since we're, we're all creatives, I mean, we're all actors, um, and, you know, we've had to inhabit characters that have been inhabited before, or, you know, in a, you know, you know, after a while, even performing, what your, how your character would say something, or what your character would say, yeah. versus he would say this, he wouldn't say that. So that's really interesting. And I think it's very interesting writing for children's television. Yeah about how to not write down, and right? This, this is a big deal for me, right? Like I can oh, yeah. do stuff a day and night, but um, I always, at least when it comes to my work, I always try to write up, you know, mm. and let it be aspirational in that respect. There's that magic word again. Um, because even if they may not fundamentally understand the entirety of what it is you're presenting to them, you're giving them a chance to understand the emotional beats and then a chance to kind of make up the gap and and um, and kind of discover for themselves what ultimately those things meant, right? So yeah, it's a it's a big deal. And look, not all writers are created equal. Not all all, all actors are created equal. Um, that's just the reality of the situation. Uh, but man, like I think there is some there is something very empirically powerful of when you hit a voice and people can all nod their heads in agreement and be like, you know what? That's a new take on the character, but it's still the character or that mm. feels like a real person, right? A real person would have made that choice. Is it almost like your, your, your logical thinking mind moves out of the way and it comes out of intuition, that other sort of voice, that other sound, you know, it's interesting. And, and this is, this probably warrants some additional conversation with my wife because my wife is an actor, right? And I have been privy to seeing her perform and really not even being able to recognize her as a person because she's taken on an entire different persona. Um, and when we've had to interact when she's acting, it's a whole other, like she becomes a foreign individual entirely, right? So she's pulling from a place, I think that it, it's magical and unto itself. Again, I can only speak to the, the writer end of the spectrum. It's, for me, it's weird. And I think it comes down to what we were talking about earlier is, it started in play. It started at a very young age, building a world, building a story, building a character, and knowing that like this character is going to be my character of the pen will behave in a very different way, um, right? And and then it became consistent, and it was serialized, and it was all being built in my mind. So I think that's really just I don't know. I'm I'm falling into a rabbit hole, folks. But yeah, no, it comes yeah. from a very unknown place, but it's. It's an authentic place. So Absolutely. good. Yeah. So good. You totally. should write a book on this, Jason. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> no, not right now. Not right now. Not right now. start on my imaginary typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, you had a, uh, a second game I to play do. It's short. It's, sh it's short. It's, it's for all of us because okay. I know you guys haven't seen it. So this is this will be cute. So, oh, yeah. Jason, I guess through – I, I want to say this right. Through Power Rangers, you worked for Hasbro? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So – I want to just all of us weigh in on these five popular Hasbro toys. Jason, okay. I don't think you had anything. You had nothing to do with these toys, I don't think. Probably so not. So let's weigh in. Let's weigh in on the baby alive, shall we? Oh, baby alive. Ooh. Now, this, yeah. pee, this pees, right? This is the baby alive that pees? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think depending on which generation, yeah. Pees or eats. And then... Poop. Yeah. Burps, definitely burps. The tongue yeah. always goes. I know that you get can sleepy. It, the tongue always goes. The mouth is yeah. motorized. Yeah, yeah. Matt, yeah. do we? Matt, closed. do you like that? No, because my sister had one, and the dolls creep me out. Just they, they look. There's that um, 
they're like just just too human looking uh and it's i was just... gonna make the very basic joke matter oh yeah dolls creep you out don't turn around but i know they're not dolls they're action figures <laughs> 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 no but uh the the blinking eyes always got yeah me. yeah okay no, it wasn't the shitting. It was the blinking eyes. It was blinking eyes. <laughs> yeah, fine. So, no, that's not, not a problem. No, 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 no. That's, I, that's all I want to know. I used all to right. work on water babies at Playmates, right? If you, you remember water babies? They're like... I've heard of like, them. Yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah. They, it's, like a, it's basically like a fancy um, water bladder, like what you would have... Uh, anyway, so it. what's so crazy about water babies, though, is we would inject baby powder sent into the, the actual roto mold. Um, cast of the body. So when you pull these things out of the package, like they smelled like a nursery. It was real creepy. That's wow. brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's crazy. Would the smell eventually wear off? Not really. That's oh, brilliant though. Yeah. That's amazing. That's like in Disney when they pump in the scents. That's yeah. br- I'm all about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about uh, Hungry Hungry Hippos? Another Hasbro classic. Love Hungry Hungry Hippos. Love it. Thumbs Love it. So Thumbs good. Up. Worship it. If and you ask me, I worship it. The 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 premise of the game is so great because you don't have to explain anything. It's just whoever eats the most marbles wins. Right. Yeah. 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 I yeah. don't as much. I don't as much love going to uh, day camp in the summers where they'd have the hungry hungry hippos, but the the marbles were all gone. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> not as fun. <laughs> clap. Not as fun. Clap. Clap. Just clap. clapping. Cla- yeah. Not as good. Um, when I was at Blizzard, we tried to do a hungry hungry zerg, but we couldn't get it past Hasbro at the time. Uh, <laughs> what's Zerg? Sorry. Zerg are the, like, it's an alien species in StarCraft. They're one of the Got it. antagonists. You don't know your Got StarCraft, it. Frank. Uh, you don't excuse even know what me, uh, Frank. Uh, <laughs> I also was a huge fan of I Love Lucy growing up, and I think that's why I got into theater and comedy. Every episode of I Love Lucy. That I know. That mm-hmm. was my thing growing up. Okay. Oh, oh, I was like, where's he going with this? Hungry, I, know, I, want, hungry I want you to know that I had a childhood. Hungry Fred okay. Mertz? <laughs> hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hungry, hungry Fred Mertz. His pants ate his tie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How about Lincoln Logs? Now, there's a lot of knockoffs to Lincoln Logs, but a true Lincoln Log is what? Hasbro. But why is it Lincoln Log? Because it's like Lincoln's cabin? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Lincoln cut down the cherry history tree, involved? wood. Yeah, yeah. history involved. Honestly, <laughs> I was more of a tinker toy guy. So, oh, oh. yeah, yeah, no. I'll, and well, yeah, you didn't become toys. an engineer. You were a tinker toy guy, uh, an Imagineer. Could have been you. I know. Which All was right. the one that came in the tube? Tinker yeah. toys. Was it tinker toys? No, not the the plastic ones that would connect. Oh. Yeah, not, it wasn't connects. It was tinker toys, right? Yeah, yeah with Lincoln the wooden came in with the wooden tube. joints, right? Wooden joints, but like plastic rods. Yeah, yeah. Lincoln Logs Wait, also came in a tube. What were the connector joints that were like yellow and it would have like, and you could. Connects. Connects. That was Connects. Yeah. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking Those of Those are the best. Also, who had Connects? Renee Goldfarb. Oh, okay. Renee Goldfarb, Goldfarb with her Renee skip Goldfarb. it. Her Don't skip it and her Connects. We got two more. Here we go. Play Doh. Play Doh by Hasbro. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Play-Doh. Classic. Come Can't on. go wrong. Oh, my God. Still awesome. You want to talk about a smell? Oh, yeah. yeah. Love it. You can instantly conjure it in your mind. Love instantly. it. Instantly for the anniversary but, of Play Doh, they were releasing a a uh, a perfume Eau de Play Doh, <laughs> and it was a perfume that smelled like Play Doh. And I was too young at the time. Well, I guess I wasn't like in high school, but I couldn't order it for myself. And now it's like you can't find it anywhere. So this is just an anecdotal thing for Matt, and Matt's going to be the only one to appreciate this. But Matt, during the um, the 2017 film, we yep. tried to do a basic putty. Um, for the film, but it was a it would come as a compound and a mold, oh. so that you to build your own putty and then come oh. part. That would have been awesome. And then it would have taken it. it. Not easy. Punch it. I punch it. Punch it in the Z. Yeah, Take it. Punch it. Punch it. <laughs> <laughs> you ready for the last one? Last this is going to be controversial. The last one, perhaps it was it was a a worldwide phenomenon around Christmas time many years ago. We're going. Do you know what I'm saying here? The Furby. Oh, oh Furby, Furby's not my jam. I don't like Furby. I find it. I have two. I hated them both. She has two working Furbies. Yeah. Oh, what what was the appeal to the Furby? What what was the appeal? Why did, were... why did people punch each other in Walmart for a Furby? I was really into Furby. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> you were? Oh, I was. I, I had one. I did the, have one. I liked the um, voices or like the noises that they made. Yeah. They were cute. What would you do with them? What did oh. they do? They just looked at you. Uh, they, they didn't blinked. Do 
They blinked. Yeah. They let you, like, bite. I don't know. Like, if you put your, like, finger in the mouth, they bit you, and it was, like, as cute. I have no idea. I guess. Cute That's terrifying. Did you, have, Jason, did you have a Furby? I didn't have a Furby, no. Not my thing. Oh. No. Oh, not right. a Furby fan. Good choice. No. I don't know. I liked Furby, guys. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, Tickle Me Elmo. Tickle Me Elmo. Yeah. I love Tickle Me Elmo, too. I couldn't get one. My Maybe that's why you loved it. It's what you yeah. couldn't have. It's what you couldn't have, John. It was the forbidden fruit for you. <laughs> I want to touch on something. J- Jason, I want to touch on something quick before we go. Sure, sure. Um, you, you brought up that I wanted the you The 2017 Power Rangers film. Yeah. I loved it. Great. I, and I know a lot of people <laughs> who loved it. I actually had this conversation with my boss the other day who said, that was a great movie. Like, yeah. everybody loved it. And you probably can't speak on it, but like... Sure I can. What happened? Oh, that's easy. That's easy to explain. So uh, I'll give you a couple things at you. So for the sake of saying it, I'll never forget what it was to step onto the the actual um, floor of the command ship, right? Like I will always remember the tactile value of stepping onto those tiles and like seeing it all. It was real. It was built unbelievable. We were in Vancouver. It was amazing. Um, okay. So, uh, the movie's great. It had an A cinema score, which is very difficult to achieve, which means, um, basically four quadrants of of the audience all vehemently loved it. They felt the character progression was great. Blah, 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 blah. We also set a little bit of history with that film. So believe it or not, um, in the third act, when the Rangers call their Zords, right. Uh, uh, everybody remembers it for playing the orchestral version of the, the Mighty Morphin theme from the original Fox film. Believe it or not, that was originally a temporary track. Um, it was uh, it was supposed to be an original recording. Now, when you make a movie, um, they do a lot of audience testing. Perhaps that'll, that's ta- you know tacit these days. But the way that it works is you you have a stopper in your hand, and you basically press the stopper as an audience member every time you feel something, whether it be like happy or sad or whatever it is, right? So I can tell you that we set a little bit of history because they had put in that temporary score for that third act Zord call moment and every person in that damn theater mashed the button when they heard the song, right? So we made the decision then and there to step away from actually pursuing an A-level recording artist, redoing the theme and just keep the Fox theme. Um, So that happened with that. But what happened to that film? It's very easily understood, are you ready? We came out the week after Beauty and the Beast. Mm. Which was, That's right. That's right. Which was yeah. the lar- and continues to be the largest family film of all time. So you are talking about a billion plus dollar movie that happened to come out the week before us. Uh. We got eight. Our whole lunch got eaten. And then by the time people had recovered from going to go see um, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Boss Baby came out like two or three weeks after us. Damn Boss Baby. They were kind of like the hot newness and they just sort of, you know, that was that was the end of it. So that's really- It's a damn oh. shame. The, damn the, other shame. Piece of, the other piece of it too was that um, based on the way our distribution model worked, it really wasn't equally distributed in rest of world. It was primarily focused on North America. So we really couldn't collect any dollars overseas. Which is- Really strange. Yeah. But it's 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 a wonderful film and so Oh, it's great. Someday I'll share stories about um or maybe we'll grab a couple folks from the team and we'll share stories about what the sequel would have been. Oh, I would love that. Man, that that's that tease at the end. I was like ready. <laughs> I was ready. No, yeah, that's a great movie. It's a great yeah. movie. Yeah. And I have to say, being a uh, a Blu ray collector, which uh, I am. 1500 and counting uh, wow the home release for it is very nice oh good 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 many That's many my very buddy nice brian options. day brian day did that yeah yeah there were like four different exclusives to four different stores and they were all really nice yeah i ended up going with the best buy anybody who's wondering nice <laughs> good art on that one good art yeah. On that. yeah 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 uh so i want to i want to just kind of uh just kind of wrap up. We've gone. We've gone over time for certain. Yeah, uh, seriously. Thank you. For thank sorry, you for I get a little long winded about. Stuff. No, 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 we're no. apologizing to you. No, I've, please. Um, 
I'm not apologizing to you, Jason. Yeah, good. <laughs> Let everybody Noted, Frank, thank you. I think you want to be here, and I want to be here with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like I kind of mentioned to you before we started, right, a, a nobody in our context is somebody who does a job that you appreciate without us knowing what goes into it or without them sometimes even knowing that it's appreciated. Um, for you, behind the scenes, people buy the products that you work on and they watch the shows that you work on and the things that you produce without even realizing what it is they're doing. I mean, I, I work in TV myself and I know that like th- th- nobody even realizes besides what they're seeing on the screen or what they're holding in their hand, what went into it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you bring so much joy into so many people's houses, you know? Me, I know Danielle could order clothes or something for her art uh, art supplies or some new thing for the house, and I don't really care. I'm like, cool, there's a package downstairs. If I ordered a pop, that package is in my hand right out of the guy's, right out of the truck before it even touches the ground. <laughs> You're in the FedEx truck. Yeah. Like, it yeah. brings me so much joy just to open it and look at it and hold it, and I think that... That is a shared experience with so many people, and I think you have such a hand in that for so many people in so many different ways. And does that register at all with with you? Does it? Do you ever get to sit back and go, "Wow"? Yeah. Yes. Uh, mostly because I really care. <laughs> I'm doing these. Stu- I'm doing this stuff as much for everyone else as I'm doing it for myself. Right. So. Right. Uh, yeah, it matters. It matters when, like, I'll, I'll tell you straight, and this is a little bit of tease for you, Matt, but like the second half of the year for Beast Morphers, there's going to be a lot of really crazy cool stuff that, that happens. And it, you know, and that stuff is going to be talked about for a very long time. And I will always be grateful and always know that all, all the hard work that went into making that happen, both for myself and from a multitude of really incredible people. So yeah, um, here's the thing. If there's stuff out there that you love, whether it be comics, television, toys, or otherwise, and it it gives you something, celebrate it really for all it is worth because it took a lot of really incredible people to pull it off and a lot of happy accidents too, right? Because, you know, think about it like a movie. Um, If the actors don't do, oh, I should maybe rewind a little bit. If the writer doesn't do their job, it's not going to translate on screen. If the director doesn't do their job, it's not going to translate on screen. If the actor doesn't do it, same thing. Editor, same thing. Marketing, et cetera, same thing. And if it hits for you, it means it was this impossible collection of wonderful people doing wonderful things in the perfect, perfectly timed moment, right? So like, yeah, I love this stuff. It def- definitely registers for me. And if anything, it's like, it's the smirk in the dark, you know, getting to know that like people really care. And it's not about me. It's about pushing the thing forward. Right. It's very, very, very true. And so I think we should just take a moment to thank you for doing this and to thank you for doing everything you do. Keep up the good work. Uh, keep sending stuff to my house. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, again, thanks for the opportunity, guys. I can't wait to hear what the review was from your previous guest. And yes, <laughs> we'll kind of go from there. But. Uh, and I, I do want to shout out and recognize Matt too. Matt, thanks for making. Please do. Oh, thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Matt. I mean, you really. Matt came to us and he was like, you know, I think this guy that I know might be a great fit for the show. And as you see, Matt, Matt tends to sit back on the show. This is not just because you're here. Matt's talked more with you here than he has usually on the show. You know, he's sort of our researcher, as it were. He sits. He sits in and he just he call. He calls stuff up fast. Yeah, he just yeah. chimes in. You know. Uh, but yeah, Matt, absolutely. Thank you for, for, for reminding me, Jason, Matt, thank you so much for kind of setting this all up and bringing us together. And, uh, my pleasure. I, I had a blast. I thought this was fantastic. Yeah. Super. Yeah, right is, on. It, is it unprofessional, Jason, if I ask you, if you want to be best friends with us, <laughs> <laughs> it's not unprofessional at all. Cool. When are you going to come to New York when this whole coronavirus is over? No, yeah, forget New York. We're coming I mean, we to the Funko to headquarters. We're yeah, coming he, to the Funko headquarters. Yeah. Out. yeah and, and that's the thing. Look, um, the like I'm one of those people that just subscribes to the idea that the world can always be a little bit smaller. So um, please do hit me up if you happen to be in the LA area. Um, I would be happy to take you around the Funko Hollywood store. 
Mm -hmm. um, and inversely, if you ever want to just do this again or just hang out or whatever, especially yeah. if times don't be shy. So absolutely, absolutely. So Jason, real quick, where can we find you on the socials? Oh, it's really easy. You can just find me at my handle at Shadow Piper. That's it. There you go, and it will be in the show notes as well. And Great. Jason Bischoff, thank you for doing this. No, there thank you, is, everybody. everybody. Yay. You've been listening to the Nothing Podcast with Nobody Important, a cool side production hosted by John Pinapinto and Frank Coyote with contributors Matt Hunt, Joe Hogopian, and Tom Zaccheo, and engineered by me, Danielle Rose Fisher. Find us online at nothing-podcast.com and be sure to rate and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are distributed. 